What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Eastern Current. God, I say that every freaking time. But welcome to another episode of Eastern Current. <laughs> uh, we're excited about our guest we've got tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, some fishing that's is some of my favorite stuff to do. Unfortunately, we don't get to do it here in Southern North Carolina nearly as much as they do up in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, but but it's going to be we've, we've got a really great captain on that's going to talk about you know mostly targeting bull redfish and cobia, but he's also going to speak on all the other you know fisheries that the, the Chesapeake Bay has to offer throughout the year, which I think will be pretty interesting and or I know will be pretty interesting. So that's going to be great. But before we bring him on, I just want to remind y'all about our Patreon account. If you do love this podcast, go check that out. You can subscribe to that um, and you get some extra content uploading all these podcasts on there earlier and some extra little um, short podcasts just kind of going over some some daily um, tackle stuff and, and things like that. So go check that out. Also go check out Eastern Current Fishing on Facebook. It's a group for all the listeners to, to hang out and talk and, and do all that. But you've been uh, have you been fishing at all lately? You've yeah, some, a little bit. Top water fishing lately, huh? Yeah, I've probably lost the most fish on top water so far this year than I ever have. It's a good way to start. I know. It's a great way I to start. Did, I almost <laughs> threw my rod in the water the other day. I had like four or five fish on that popped off. Oh gosh. In, in one morning and I'm like, is it me? Is it the plug? It's you. <laughs> is it my rod? I was in a spot this morning and I was pulling down this edge and I looked and I was like, that looks like a top water plug floating. And I pulled over there. It was a plug I'd lost like two weeks ago, and a dip, like Shut up. halfway out the creek. Yeah, I found it, got it back, cleaned it off. It's sitting in the boat right yeah, now. Yeah, I so. have a kind of a crazy story like that too. I had one morning where I threw one on a, a it barely caught an oyster uh-huh. that was underwater, and we were, you know, we were catching fish. So I just ended up breaking it off, and uh, four hours later, we're like two miles away, probably fishing in a bay and I see a little white plug floating on top of the water and it's the plug I lost. That's pretty awesome. Back up. That's pretty awesome. Um, saving your money there. Those things are expensive. I know. Well, cool. Well, let's bring on our guest here, Mr. Tyler. Is it Non? That's how you say it, right? Tyler Non? Yeah, Non. Yep, okay. you got her. Sweet, sweet. Well, thanks for coming on, man. We're excited. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, it's, uh, thanks Thanks for having me here. But uh, yeah, so what, what kind of topwater fishing were y'all doing down there? Just for uh, redfish, slot, mostly. Slot redfish. Yeah. This uh, kind of the main inshore yeah. deal. Y- y'all get to, uh, y'all's redfish. I don't even like y'all to see the redfish we catch down here compared <laughs> to what y'all catch over <laughs> there. <laughs> we're catching a little puppy drum. But be it's fun inshore in shallow water. It's it's a great time. It's it's all about the, you know, the bite. You know, that's, that's what you right. tell yourself when you catch a little fish. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> It's a sweet eat. <laughs> it's a sweet eat for sure, for sure. Well, uh, well, cool. Well, let's uh, let's let's let people learn about you a little bit. We kind of start each episode. When we have a guest on. Tell us about how you got into fishing, where you grew up, and kind of how it's brought you to where you are today as a, as a full time charter captain. Roger that. Uh, so I well, I guess the whole thing started. Uh, my dad was a big crabber on Chesapeake. That's all he he loved to do. And then uh, you know when I was growing up, um, you know the, the we couldn't rock fish and until the moratorium was lifted and uh, our first spring season in the upper bay uh was 1998 i think and uh that was i saw the most craziest stuff ever you know catching giant fish as a little kid and that really got me hooked and uh it's a really only hobby i've ever had was fishing and crabbing and stuff like that and then uh i started i started guiding in college and uh, i worked in alaska in the summertime and uh, that kind of snowballed into a full-time gig. And, um, you know, when I got enough money saved up, then I got a, my first center console and uh, kind of went from there. Heck yeah. Uh, but, yeah, so that's, that's probably how the whole thing got started. But, yeah, my dad always crabbed, and uh, I was always on the water doing something, and fishing just, I don't know, got me. It got me good. Yeah, for sure. Were you uh, when you were working in Alaska? Were you guiding up there? Or, or yeah, yep. Cool. I worked. Uh, let's see. I did seven full summers, and then I did uh, four or five just September's. Mm-hmm. I worked for uh, the last lodge I worked for uh, Alaska Sportsman's Lodge on the Queen yeah. Jack River. Awesome. And, and uh, yeah, I spent a lot of time up there, and that was a lot of fun, man. It was a good experience. I did that, you know, for a bunch of years in my twenties, and uh, taught you how to work. And I mean, them they were. It's hard work. There's, you know, really. Yeah, you're not just a fishing guide up there. You're everything. Yeah, I, you know, drum the pool across the tundra up to your up to your nuts and mud. You right. know. It's, it's bad. It's bad. Nobody likes nut mud. No. No. It's worse. no. It's the worst. 
Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. But, well, uh, so when you came back from that, were you right into guiding, you know, here in the States? Or I guess Alaska is the States too. Yeah. But, yeah. And it, yeah. Here on, on the Chesapeake Bay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, you know, so after my first summer, you know, I saved up. I bought a commercial license in Maryland, uh, which allowed me to charter fish. And then uh, I got a center console, got a twenty foot sea craft. Uh, was Sweet. my first rig, and I started hustling as hard as I could. And then when I first got started, you know, like the internet, I guess Facebook was around, but like it wasn't like a big deal. So the like, first like four or five years were slow, mm-hmm. um, just getting the ball rolling. You know, it, and, you know, nowadays if you've got a Facebook page and a boat, you're uh, officially a fishing guide. Oh but yeah, it, it wasn't quite like that when uh, I first started. No, it's but, uh, uh, it's gotten easy to become a fishing guide for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Post everything and yeah, here you go. Exactly. When you, um, Tyler, when you first started uh, guiding, were you specifically targeting um, redfish and cobia, or was that no, something you hadn't really it, gotten into yet? Kind of been a big paradigm shift. You know, when I first started running, uh, I was doing lots of rockfish trips. Like that was my primary target species, and you know, it was. You know, after the moratorium, like the first ten years after it lifted, like our rock, fi- our striped bass fishery was wild. Well, yeah. I'm talking giant ones crawling over each other, trying to eat eat poppers, and like it was the most ridiculous saltwater fishing on planet Earth. You know, That's I mean, so just sick. you know, yeah, you'd catch thirty or forty big ones, you know, in an evening. You know, it, they were so it was so crazy when they first lifted. I remember. We had a uh, like a skiff, and we would run across a flat until we'd spook like a giant acre school, go upwind of them, and start throwing pencil poppers and pork. <laughs> oh we my didn't even god! Have a we had no side scan, no bottom machine, no nothing. We were just ripping them a new one, and uh, it was all catch and release. Um, but you know, those same that same body, migratory body of fish, when they you know, go, go through the Chesapeake, they get picked on for our trolling season, and then they get eeled on up north, and there's just a lot of anglers, you know, through their journey that, that put a good whooping on them, and uh, now it's just not really what it was, and then I started fading, uh, you know, into some other species as, because I couldn't recreate the things that, you know, people mm-hmm. had seen, you know, in previous years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. God, that's so tough, man. Has, yeah. has, um... Has cobia fishing and the bull red fishing always been uh, really good in the Chesapeake? Yep, it all, it all, you know, since the, I'm sure the pilgrims were, were blasting it through them <laughs> in, in their sailboats. <laughs> yeah. You know? um, yeah, I mean, it has, even like there's like, you know, historical black and white photos of, you know, giant, giant cobias and reds and I mean, everything. But yeah. um, it's, uh, yeah, I, I always think of like pre-industrial revolution, like how many fish were kicking around was probably scary. They're probably just harpooning them yeah. off the The sides. idea <laughs> of like what normal fishing is now compared to what it should have been without our interaction is, oh is mind-blowing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. We, I mean, even, even around here, you hear old-timers talk about going out and catching redfish around here. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's like catching 20 in a day was not a good day. Yeah, oh, for sure. And, and the bull red fishing down here, even off our coast, I mean, it's great off the Outer Banks, but even down here, like, you see old pictures of, mm-hmm. of guys fishing the piers and whatnot, just catching lots of bull reds, lots of cobia, and um, yeah. we just, all these fish, I mean, we, we forget what normal is because it, maybe it fades out just slow enough that you kind of start to to not remember what it was like five years sure. ago. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think people people forget, man. I mean, uh, I've been tagging them for the last few years, and even in the, you know, the handful of years, uh, I think yes, yeah, our fifth year of tagging, and uh, even in in that time frame, I mean, I, I just you watch the fish shrink and the average year class shrink, and uh, I mean that's you know we still have a real good uh, cobia, and our drum fishery is, exce- is exceptional. You know, it's a slot limit here, so them big ones they just keep getting bigger and more and more. Um, and that's, and that's awesome. You know, yeah. we don't get much puppy, you know, we, are, we have no really puppy drum fishery on the Eastern shore until like fall time, speckled trout mm-hmm. season. You know, we, we catch mm-hmm. puppy drum. Mm-hmm. In nice. But, um, do you, uh, w- with the, with the striper, do you see that there's a fix? Like, can we get back to what we had? Um, yeah, you know, they're, they're, yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, maybe some more proactive management should have happened. You know, everything in fisheries management seems to be reactive instead of proactive. Right, right. But I mean, they'd, be, they'd be crucified, at, at, you know, on a stake if they were, you know, to have a, you know, a 
preemptive move or, you know, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. You know, it's, I mean, hindsight's twenty twenty. you know, and um, it's, it's interesting. Fisheries management, I wouldn't want to be in that business no. because somebody's going to light your truck on fire. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no but, matter what your decision is, either way. Yeah, that's what it is. Either way, so you're yeah. going to piss somebody off. Exactly. But I mean, uh, I would say, you know, it, right now they did an 18% federal reduction, okay. um, which is great. You know, I think um, I think recreational anglers should uh, have a little more responsibility because there's by you know we're the vast amount of the fish taken are by wreck guys. I mean, there's millions, hundreds of thousands of wreck guys every day. You know, wearing fish out. You know, and nowadays they're in two hundred thousand dollar rigs and they got side scan, up scan, down periscope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, and, and they got you know the social media feeds. You know, their yeah. people are on fish now so hard. You know, you don't got to go burn a pile of fuel and go find them. They they just scroll through their feeds and they can you know people can figure out all kinds of stuff yeah. off the internet. Definitely, man. I mean everybody. Like these days especially on a large fishery like like you've got I, when you said that it kind of made me think you know back to I, I used to spend I spent a couple years guiding in Louisiana and you kind of watch the guides from up you know along the coast to see where the clean water is where the where the you know the big pushes of those redfish have come and I feel like it'd be the same thing with a striper it's like oh they're catching them down by the tunnel and then all of a sudden you know they're bumping up the, and you can just follow that migration on your phone <laughs> So. Uh, oh yeah, you can for sure. And uh, like half the time, you can tell where somebody's at from the water color, or like you yeah. know, just like little tiny, little tiny cues. But I mean, everybody is, you know, and everybody wants to put everything out there, you know, and be an internet hero. I don't know. It's uh, the social media is a, is a double edged sword. You for know, sure. it's a, it's been really, it's changed fishing, uh, you know, for sure, a hundred percent. But uh, it's also pretty cool. So I mean, I just like looking at fish pictures and stuff too. (laughs) Me too. Me too. Yeah. It's almost like our senses have become dulled though to like pictures, and now it's like you need straight up like hardcore video of like fish. You know what I mean? Like everyone's seen the the grip and grin of every big fish, and now you need videos of everything eating topwater. So yeah, Yeah. it's got to be top slow motion, ultra slow motion topwater to dubstep music. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. With six six drones, you know, GoPros everywhere. Uh, so I, I see some people fishing. It looks like they're, I mean, in a spacesuit, wearing all this crazy shit on their <laughs> chest and cameras. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it, the the content creation has definitely taken over the fishing, and it's uh, it, like you said, it's a double edged sword. And, and as a fishing guide, you know, it's a great way to market, but it's also a great way to put unnecessary pressure on fish. So it's uh, you got to be careful with with what you put out there and. Mm-hmm. And it, uh, you know, one thing I do see, and with this podcast, because I've had some local guys here be like, why the heck are you creating this podcast, kind of talking about fishing, explaining, you know, scenarios. And But I, I'm a big fan of conservation, and I feel like the more people that we can, like, help understand our voice for, like, an, an issue, the better off we are. Like, the more successful anglers we have that, that are conservation-minded, I think the better our fishery is. Just like duck hunting, like the main people that are, you know, giving money to wetlands conservation are actual duck hunters, you know, and so. First, 100%, 100%. Yeah, that's kind of, I mean, it's, but like you said, it's all double-edged sword. It's, it's a tough, it's a tough, uh, tough break there, but well, uh, well, that, that's cool. I've always wanted to get up there and catch one of those big striper. I think my biggest striper is like 33 inches, which is nothing compared to what I see some, some of those fish from out there, there look like. We, we, had, we still do have, I mean, there's some pockets of them and stuff, and we still catch a couple sea donkeys, man, and, but, uh, I mean, a giant, Straight bass. I mean, he is that thing has been through war and back. I yeah. mean, he's swam New England and back and been eating lobsters and all kinds of wild stuff. And, That's cool. You know, when you see a giant one, you just look at him and you're like, you have got to be kidding me. This thing yeah. is wicked. That's so sick. So, how a, a full, what's the biggest one you've ever laid your hands on? Mm, I've I've caught a bunch uh, over fifty inches, and uh, I would you know those big ones like we didn't like weigh them a lot yeah, of times, yeah. but I would say. Biggest one, the heaviest one I've probably ever touched personally is probably like a 55 pounder, nice, something like that, like a 53 incher. You know, it, once you get over, once you get right in that 50 inch ballpark, like every inch is crazy. I mean, they go for, and some of them can be bloated. You know, uh, a bloated 51 incher can, you know, sometimes can be, you know, ash, you know, heavy as all get out. Yeah, so it just, I'd say 55 pounds is, or maybe 56 somewhere in there. I had a buddy of mine got a got a 67 and he uh he actually weighed that in a net and so that i mean in he subtracted a net weight or whatever but that was that fish was that fish was like 50 
I think it was almost 54 inches, like 53 and three quarters or something. It was a stud. It was the biggest one I've Holy never seen that. a picture of. Do those yeah. stripers, because um, you mentioned earlier you used to take a skiff and, and uh, find them by just seeing a, a, like an acre of them pushing. Do, it, yep. Were you fishing shallow water for those? And if so, do they still get yeah, shallow? Yeah. Yeah, they they still get shallow. I mean, the the in the upper bay there is a pocket. Uh, it's like a little offshoot bay. It's called the Susquehanna Flats, and it's like one of this big spawning area. And it's like a I don't know, like nine square miles, and the average depth is like three or four feet. And uh, I mean, they would they would pack in there super dense, and they'd be in there for about a month um, in April, obviously. And uh, nowadays it really doesn't happen like that. But um, you know, that was they were in three four feet of water, and we just. We would drive and you would spook just giant, giant schools of them. And it was so silly I just cannot, turning upwind. I cannot start. imagine what seeing yeah. a wakes from an acre of <laughs> massive stripers yeah. would even look like. It would just yeah. look like a big old pot of dolphins yeah. <laughs> running yeah, through there. Just mud. Yeah, thousands, yeah, thousands of them, dude. Thousands of them. That's so Good sick. Gracious. And uh, if you've done any striper fishing, you know that they do like to eat top water. So then you yeah. got to think when there's and that many even, those big ones in there, like just yeah. And if those big ones are anything like the small ones, and they don't have very good aim, which it makes it even more exciting. <laughs> yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, well, cool. Well, let's let's the kind of dive into you know what you're going through this part of the season, which is the cobia and the red yep. fishing and and why we're on the the talk of conservation is there is there an issue at all in the bay with the cobia fishery that that you've seen or is it kind of a healthy fishery no i mean you know with you know we still have a bunch of fish um but you know with with missing the other apex predator species with missing striped bass everybody has changed their focus to these other species um and because there's not because there's there is no real striped bass fishery that's productive you know yeah. there's just there's not, you don't have many encounters so everybody started to mess with them big time here the last few years and putting big fish on the internet and getting everybody all giddy. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, they, they're they getting hammered on. You know, yeah. we've had a lot of our tagged fish have been, you know, caught multiple times. And our our um, our return rate on tags is super crazy high, which is very worrisome because there's not a big biomass uh, like you would think of uh, striped bass as a whole, that's a huge giant group of migratory fish that are just, they're ridiculous in numbers. They're supposed to be. You know, cobias are more of uh it's, it's, it's not nearly, they're not nearly as prolific, you know, a, as a fish species, you know, that, as striped bass. So, I mean, they're, and they're easy to catch, you know, they, you can see them. I yeah. mean, it, it, it's, not that, it's not that hard. Yeah, any fish that floats <laughs> right on the surface real slow is pretty yeah. easy to catch. It's like, there's one. All right, let's see if we catch them. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, but you know, and they have to be in that warm water. You know, they're just they're continually growing and metabolizing and trying to break down. You know, what what they're eating and I mean, they're growing like a weed. Yeah. So, uh, you know, they're very susceptible to being cat to being caught rather. Yeah. So, I mean, I you know, it's it's still fairly strong, and but there's going to be they have also continually changing uh regulations you know for for cobias every year almost is changing it used to be one fish per person then it's been three fish per vessel and you know uh i run two boats here in the bay full time and we've never we try to only kill two a day um you know if people want to take home fish we keep them at two max which is still plenty of meat for everybody to go home and uh you know as somebody asked me you know when i started doing that why i was doing that if three is the legal deal and you know, I said, well, do you trust the government to make all your decisions for you here? You know, I, you know, I, I wouldn't let them walk my dog. You know, right. that's how right. I trust. Them. So that's why we started doing that. We felt like it was the right thing to do. And we've been doing that for the last couple of years. And, um, you know, anybody who un understands conservation or that everybody wants to catch fish too. everybody yeah. wants to fish for the future. That's what, you know, fishing people want to catch fish and to go fishing. So if if throwing a couple more back today helps you catch more tomorrow then who wouldn't be all about that yeah mm -hmm. definitely so. what's the quickest you've ever gotten a tag back uh with uh, that th we call it the next day the next day <laughs> oh my gosh that's crazy <laughs> yeah we had one we had one last year that got caught nine times holy really holy moly yeah what so is are they keeping the tag in that fish you're not cutting the tags out no, there that that was that was a short fish. Okay. So he was only like thirty six inches and apparently dumber than a box of bricks. Yeah. So his, he liked his colorful ass, jigs. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he, uh, he, he is so hungry right now. He's probably biting something right now. I swear to God. He's like, he's eating something. I, yeah, I promise you. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, so that's alarming. You know, and that, that just, you know, goes to show you that there's not tons of them. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we started doing this tagging deal because I'd say it was seven or eight years ago. I saw a fish with a pink bucktail stuck in his back. And I saw that same fish for like 25 days in a row. And I was like, huh, isn't that interesting? How many of these things what are out the there, heck? you know? And uh, Yeah. And one of my like good client buddies, he funded this tagging program. And as far as I know, it's the only privately funded tagging program that I know of. And then all of our data is recorded and then compiled. And uh, we work with... Um, or uh, like a Virginia State agency, we're giving all them the data, you know, when it's compiled. That's and, great. You know, so it's a it's a private tagging deal, which is kind of unique. So there's no no fudging anything. Nobody's telling any of us what to do, which is very unique. Yeah. I think. Like there's no, you know, it, it's uh, and we're everything is you know to the T, and we keep very you know super sweet records, and uh, it's going to be exciting to see what happens in a in a few more years of this, and see see where it goes. What's the um. I think tagging is so interesting. Yeah, for what's sure. The, what, yeah. What's the uh, furthest you've seen one migrate? Well, West, we've had a bunch of returns from like West Palm uh, in Florida. Well, Holy moly. Um, so yeah. tell me if I'm right about this. I had someone who, who studies cobia out of um, like the Atlantic Beach, Moorhead area tell me this, that there's really two biomasses of these cobia. And there's like one yeah. that moves north to south and one that moves like in and out from the Gulf to back in, in, in shore. Yeah, I mean, they, they they try to break them up into a couple of different biolog- you know, biological groups, and uh, in the golf fish are separate too. And even in the golf, there's you know, like those big old school destined fish when they were catching them 110 pounders in the 80s. The guys who pioneered the sport, and, you know, those uh, you know, those or they, or they don't really exist anymore. But those fish aren't the same fish that we catch in the Keys because you know nobody's in the Keys in the golf. If you caught a hundred pound cobia in the Gulf in the Keys, it would make uh, the headlines. I mean, like yeah. it, it's never, you know, that's not a thing. They, you'll get an ocean fish on a on a ray or something, maybe that's a sixty or seventy pounder down there. That'd be a that would still make the paper. But um, yeah. you know, it is it's really hard. It's and I'm sure there's some intermixing too. Like and that's why you know for management purposes, it probably makes sense to break to break them up into different groups. You'd have to. Yeah. You know you can't. You know because uh, with all the migratory, with all migratory fish, I mean, fisheries management is, I don't know, a really tough deal, and I feel bad for them guys. And they have a limited data set they're working with too. I mean, they're not out there. If they had unlimited data set, or they return, say that, like in Alaska, where they return salmon return to a river, and they can count them all and get escapement numbers, and then it's a it's a much easier management, you know, yeah. mm-hmm. idea. Mm-hmm. So, um, but yeah, there's some intermixing, you know, and uh, you know, our Chesapeake fish have been caught in Florida, you know, um, and you know, we've caught lots of tag fish. Last year, we caught a besides our tag fish, which we caught a couple of our tag fish again. We did, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, we caught you know a bunch of other tags from different states and North Carolina and um, where else? Uh, a lot of North Carolina fish. Um, and then Virginia Marine Institute of Science, they tag a bunch of them. We caught a bunch of their tagged fish and, um, it's, so there's a lot of, there's a lot, there's a lot of fish being caught, you yeah. know, you know, and, uh, you know, there's probably, there's gotta be a bunch of intermixing, you know, with different, different little groups and stuff. And, Definitely. You know, to say, yeah, to say there's like, they break or they like stop at Georgia and there's two different groups at the Georgia Florida line, <laughs> you know, that'd be, that'd be crazy. Yeah. You'd, you'd have to, <laughs> <laughs> be a serious. They also have their own up. language. Each, they have different languages. Each biomass yeah. has their own language that they speak. <laughs> yeah, maybe they're a different color. Like ones are a little more brown, and ones are a little <laughs> yeah. more light. Yeah. You know, That's that Georgia different. fish, that light colored fish over there. <laughs> yeah, he's got to be from Georgia. I hear his accent. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I, I, one thing that I was thinking too, when you were talking about how you're doing this private tagging program, is I, it's another great way to really preach conservation to your clients on the boat, like. Not well, only they do they, like, not only are you saying, like, let's not kill this fish, but like, hey, let's tag this. This fish you just caught can help us study this population of fish. And, I mean, I feel like that would get a client more into being like, oh, I don't need to keep any. Let's just tag them all and let them go, you know? So that's oh, cool. Yeah, they, it, 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 and people get super into it, too. And uh, me and, and my partner, Robbie, we, uh, you know, we try to tag a, a, you know, a couple every day or, you know, when we can. Sometimes it's, if it's rough or something, you know, it's it, it gets crazy with the fish getting beat up and stuff. So we try yeah. to pick our date when we do it. But... I mean, it's uh, 
We got our, we got her pretty dialed, and uh, it's down to a science, man. We get them in the net, leave them in the water. We have everything prepped and ready, and uh, you know, it, it, I, we we feel like uh, like well, you see them O search guys on the yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know, like it's you know we we get super into it, and uh, you know just it's fun just try to you know take care of the fish and uh, be a be, be a nice guy on the water. What comes around goes around. Maybe if, if I end up a cobia in different life, people. Won't. <laughs> Me you're gonna be that dumb one eating that orange bucktail over and over again oh uh, yeah I'd, I'd get caught 100 times i would too i would too um <laughs> well sweet well let's let's move into the red fishing a little bit so are, are you targeting those red fish in this exact same areas you're seeing the the cobia or is there a little bit more of a science behind finding those fish yeah i mean you'll find I mean, in the springtime when they first show up in uh you know usually they, they start coming in in april in decent numbers and uh you know, they're in the shallow water then, you know, they're looking for crabs, uh, you know, and the shallow water obviously is warmer then. And then we find them leaving the shallow water, you know, uh, and the flats in mid May. And they start balling up in these like kind of big, uh, big nomadic groups, you know, and we'll find, you know, we'll find them over top of structure or on shoals or on a ledge. And, like, they'll be in a certain area, a certain, like, a couple acres or a mile, square mile or two for a few days. And they'll slide around here and there. And a lot of times they're just sitting and chilling on the surface. Um, and then every now and then you catch them when they're going full-blown bananas and, like, busting on bunkers. And mm-hmm. uh, that looks like – I mean, Louisiana has a great red fishery. And I guess they see them like when they're in the like off the coast, and they see them bust in, and they have the yeah. pelicans dive on them and shit. Yeah, we don't see that a lot. A lot of times they're just kind of hovering there, and uh, over top of something, a hard bottom, or you know something like that. Yeah. And uh, you know when you find them sitting there, you're like you, you have a double take. You're like, good night. What is that? Yeah. You know, because there's like, <laughs> like a thousand of them. You know, and uh, so and that's really sweet, and uh, it's a very unique thing. And uh, <clears throat> our red fishery, the average fish is, I mean, it, he's a beast. You yeah. know, he's a large unit, um, and uh, so that makes it really fun. And it's a slot limit, so they're almost always oversized. I don't think I've caught a slot fish in in years. I know I haven't. They're all like 38 to 42 average, and then we get a lot of fish that are like 45, 46, 48 inches. You know, you'll get one over 50. You know, if you get into a big pot of fish, you'll catch one over 50 almost every time. Well, that's um, sweet. Yeah. That's sweet. It's so uh, that- it, People think Louisiana is like the home of the big bull redfish, but they don't realize that North Carolina and, and uh, Virginia are really the, the homes of the big redfish. I oh, mean. yeah. The, the world <laughs> yeah, is, is from North Carolina, you know. I forget what that 90-something 97 pounds. 97 I mean. pounds, I believe it is. Mm-hmm. Could you imagine what that thing would look God, like? Dude. Like a dinosaur. You could ride it. You would have it, you know, <laughs> beside your boat, and you would be like, no, 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 it's not a redfish. Like, you'd be looking right at it and be like, there's no way that's a redfish. <laughs> I wouldn't want to touch it. He'd bite, he'd bite your hand yeah, off. Yeah, he would. For sure. <clears throat> um, yeah, that that's cool, man. The So... Will you? Would you say you bump into cobia more so looking for the redfish, or bump into to redfish more so looking for the cobia? Is that kind of a hard yeah, question to answer? I, I mean, we don't find the reds floating every day. I mean, uh, you know, August is probably one of our favorite months to find to find the big groups of reds floating. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, we're you know cobia fishing, and um, and we get run into the the groups of reds, and and um, when the when the fish get closer to spawning, like in August, then they also they love holding on structure. So we do a lot of uh, a lot of bottom fishing and live bait for them gotcha. uh, too in, in August, and that's that's much more consistent than find them floating. You find them floating is a special thing, you know. Mm-hmm. It's um, you know, there it's like uh, some National Geographic, you know, yeah. wild stuff. That's but sweet. you know the yeah. So when you <clears throat> when you're bottom fishing for them, or or even when you're cubia fishing, you. Do you ever just see a big mass of them on your machine and you're like, uh, drop right here? (laughs) Oh yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, especially when you're, when you're, when you're fishing around structure too. I mean, you, you can see them. I mean, and cause they're so a tight knot of them when you, when you mark them, you, you know what you're seeing. And, uh, yeah, for sure. Everybody's dropping jigs. And a lot of times when you pull one or two up, like more of them start following and Mm -hmm. it can be just like, you know, you know, they just curious fish and they'll try to bite the bucktail out of, or whatever out of the other one's mouth. I mean, they're a bunch of crazy pigs. I mean, they'll try to. <laughs> I remember my first season in, in Louisiana. We, it was like, I had fished down there a bunch, and but this is my first season down there guiding, and 
the first I had gotten on schools of redfish, big schools of redfish down there, but nothing like like this one day we ran out there and there was just menhaden or bunker everywhere and there was redfish everywhere and I'm like you throw the popping cork, pop it once like but you're not even finished popping and it just goes down and yeah. we'd fight the fish for like 30 seconds and break them off and then throw it out there again fight the fish for like 30 seconds and break it off there were so many other fish eating the cork underwater and we we ended up going to like 70 pound or 80 pound uh, liter and we were still breaking off sometimes because there would yeah. be like you know yeah. just so many other fish just t-boning that that plug or that, <laughs> that popping cork underwater um, yeah yeah same same deal like especially braid if it's under a super amount of tension you know and they start bumping into it they'll bust you off yeah. and, uh you know it, it, i see that a lot too um you know i don't come back anymore in april for uh striped bass because the fishery just uh, isn't isn't doable for me for you know the style that i used to do so i i've been in the keys uh since 2009 for about four months out of the year cool. and uh with the permit in the springtime i mean same thing like big schools of them you hook a permit like they love to run in the line you're like what well, you know what happened yeah, you know, yeah. Just bust. Like, if you back and drag way down though you can uh a lot of times you can get away with yeah, it. Break off. <clears throat> right on. Do do but. people ever target the uh, bull reds early in the season when they're shallow? Yeah, I do. I do a bunch. Um, you know, and uh, I get back to Virginia in in May, and then uh, yeah, they're you can you can see them sometimes, and a lot of times you can just you can blind cast points and bars and stuff and catch them on paddle tails. Um, they don't. They don't really respond to the pop and cork uh, like they like they do down south. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, just just throwing paddle tails and stuff like that. And if you can't see them, if you, sometimes you can see them if the water's clear enough. But it's it may is can, may can be really pretty up here, or it can be still Antarctica. I mean, it's yeah. uh, and that's relative to coming out of the Keys. So I just don't like. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. You've come out of you know ninety degree days, but. Um, yeah. Do the do the redfish stay down at the mouth of the bay for the most part there, or are they pushing up in the bay pretty far as well? Oh, they'll go. I mean, they'll go way up in in the Maryland waters of the bay. You know, the lower like uh, fifty eight miles or something is Virginia waters, and then but they'll go. I mean, even historically, I'm sure they were all the way up and down. You know, especially in the, when there's low salinity in late summer, they'll go they'll go eighty miles up in the bay. They don't care. Yeah, I yeah. mean, if there's bunker there's bunker and there's bait they i mean they all just keep pushing and you know rooting around they don't nothing bothers them things yeah yeah uh well take me through after that question kind of take me through the 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 migration of those cobia um at, once they enter the bay are they are they kind of hanging around the, the mouth most of the time or, or what's uh, the deal no, they'll, I mean, they'll, they'll go way up in the bay too okay. um they don't they also don't really care but um you know when and they'll when the, when the, the warm bay water kind of connects to that water off of Hatteras and there's a, a you know a nice highway for them to run in, in you know late May then they start just flooding in um, you know running up the beach but um, and then you know, they get in here and they'll be in here all summer and there'll be like little pushes you know fish coming in and out of the bay too but um, for the most part they're probably you know in the bay especially when the water temps are over 70 they're they're happy as a clam and um, we see fish start to leave like in good numbers like pushing leaving the bay when you get like the first couple of north blows you know in mm-hmm. late august when it starts to you know start to get chilly you can feel it when it's coming you know yeah. uh, and then you know once that starts to happen they start balling up and running out the other way you know they kind of come in in groups and they leave in groups um and then they break apart in the summertime unless they're spawning um, they'll they'll break apart and you'll just see a fish here or a fish there maybe a two or you know every now and then a three pack but they're a, they're a fairly solitary fish it seems like well, once they enter the bay they kind of disperse and you know they're all kind of sprinkled about gotcha 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 um, tell me a little bit about what you're doing down in the keys when you're down there guiding or where, where in the keys are you staying uh, I'm, I've been on big pine, on big pine and, uh, I, yeah I do mostly offshore stuff down there you know I uh, you know, I love sight fishing, and I love sail fishing down there too. But I mean, that's a lot of sight fishing. But I, when I first went down there, you know, I uh, like 2007. I went down for like a uh, 2008 maybe. I went down for like a month and just checking it out with a buddy and seeing what's up. And we did a lot of flats fishing, and uh, it's very difficult flats fishing in the winter yeah. time. It is cold. You know, you can, you can catch a couple permit, but I mean, that'd be a miracle of baby Jesus. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, you, know you, you pick up a rod and them things are, you know, shitting their pants, running scared. You know, they, they're very educated uh, like, fish down there. 
Oh man, they hear the they they know if it's a if it's a Maverick or if it's a Chinum <laughs> or an East Cape, they hear you coming. They oh, yeah. push of a they know the tick of a push pole. They do for sure. Uh, so that was that was I thought that was a really and it is a difficult, challenging fishery. And for the people that the normal guy, you know, it's it's tough. You know, it's mm-hmm. a tough tough fishery. But uh, if you take a whole bunch of bait offshore and you start, you know, live chumming and stuff, you can light the you know light the world on fire and uh, creates a very you know, easy fishery, and um, you know that and that brings you into a whole new circus of catching bait, which is the most hideous task that known to man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you talk about. I mean, I'm 34, and I got yeah, you know, I got so many. Am I 35? 34 or five? How old am I? I'm 34. <laughs> uh, you sound like me. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, catching bait is brutal on on a human. But uh, I mean, you know, tuna fishing. I do mostly tuna fishing, and um, you know, I do fish a little couple, you know, permits on the wreck in the springtime. Sail fishing in the Keys uh, in spring when they tail is ridiculous. You're sight fishing for a fish that swims 70 miles an hour, you know, right. it's fast <laughs> lightning. And uh, that can be a whole lot of fun. It, it's uh, it's like cobia fishing for a bigger, more pissed off fish. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I really enjoy uh, sail fishing in the spring. You know, like March and um, March and April, they'll tail when you... You know, when the Gulf Stream pushes up, uh, you know, against the reef, you get some, yeah. you get some really good conditions, and they start coming. I don't know where they come from. I mean, they'll be like, it'll be slow forever, and then you know, you'll get an east wind and an eastbound current, and you know, conditions will set up, and they're magically everywhere. I'm like, it's just, it, oh, this is crazy. Um, so I like doing that, and then uh, tarpon fishing too. You know, I do. Um, I don't, you know, I don't have a flats boat. I, I got two 26 foot center consoles, and I bring. I have a Jones Brothers that I bring down there, and um, you know, uh, we so I tarpon fish at the bridges and the holes and mm-hmm. out back, and we catch them. You catch them all. We catch them on bait, and we throw paddle tails at them. Yeah. I don't do. I don't do a whole lot of wizard sticking, um, just because I'm not <laughs> set up for that program. <laughs> right. Right. Now I hear you. Wizard stick. Uh, I, I I I do a lot of fly fishing, but the more I guide, the more I want to push away from fly fishing in sight. Because it's like like today, I had fly fishing clients, and it was blowing 25 miles an hour and cloudy, and the water was muddy, and the guy sucked. I'm just gonna be honest; it was not <laughs> it was not good. Um, but it was uh, it, we had a fun time, and and but I was just like, golly, man, I really am getting what a catch. I, do what? I? I want to catch. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. No, they were super cool, very laid back, but it's just tough. It's tough when you want to put guys on fish and you, and and you go out on those days, you're like, Hey, we can go throw bait or we can even go throw, you know, some spinner baits and topwater plugs and you'll catch some fish and they want to throw the fly rod. um, It it was, it was a tough day, but I I like to diversify and I feel like that's what you do as well is really kind of spread yourself out and do a lot of different types of fishing and it keeps you into it. It keeps it interesting. Yeah, and uh, you know I do. I love fly fishing. Don't get me wrong. And I do a lot of it personally. Um, and uh, you know I just like using the right tool for the right job. If conditions are are sweet and set up nice for fly, and there's fish everywhere, you know, then I I love fly fishing for tarpon. That's a lot of fun and stuff like that. But I mean, uh, and for cobias too, and reds and everything. But yeah. you know, if it's, if it's tough out, I mean, why make it tougher on you? You know, every. You know, every day is a little bit different, and I feel like, you know, you wouldn't use a three-quarter inch wrench when you needed a half inch, so why are you going to, you know, use a fly rod when you should be using a spinning rod on this day with this condition? Right, you know, right, right. Yeah. That's, where, that's where I'm at. It's and Alaska kind of ruined it ruined it a little bit for me. I kept getting hooked in the neck and stuff. And, you, know, beat <laughs> yeah. you don't like those peg beads smacking in the back of the neck? <laughs> oh, man, going Mach 6. I know, it's, yeah. uh, it's uh, those little things sting like tiny little paintballs smacking you. Yeah. But, um... <laughs> Yeah, no, I, it's I, I look at the fly rod now, like you're saying, as a tool. Like this is this is uh, awesome to use when the conditions are correct for it. Yeah, but, I mean, it really like in a super cloudy day and windy. If you don't live in a place that literally has fish everywhere, yeah. where you can just blind cast it and yeah. catch one, it's it's like, tough. It's super it's tough. It's super tough for sure. Yeah, and we don't. If I'll, you find that place where. If you find that place where fish are everywhere, let me know where it is because I'm going to move I think, <laughs> I think it's called Louisiana. <laughs> yeah, maybe Louisiana. <laughs> but it, it, even Louisiana is getting tougher, man. Tougher oh, and no. tougher each year. And this past year was my first year not down there. And people were just uh, – all my buddies were saying how – I mean, every year it seems like it multiplies and how much harder mm-hmm. it gets down there. Um, yeah. There's just so many people getting into fishing as a, as a recreational sport, well, which is awesome. That's interesting too because, like, those fish, the bull reds, like, people aren't keeping those. Yeah. 
down there, but they're still. Do you think it's just that they're catching on, or that there's well, they're like still dying after they're getting caught. I or? think they're catching on, but I think there's a huge issue with the pogie netting they do down oh, there. Yeah, they yeah, kill yeah, so yeah, many yeah. redfish netting those those big schools of pogies. You'll see just acres. I thought and they acres got of, rid of that. There's areas down there that they can still do. I don't know if they can do it everywhere, but there's a lot of areas they can still do it. And I don't know if that's. I have no clue if that's the reason that it's getting tougher. Hmm. Uh, I think it's a lot. I think there's a lot of recreational anglers put heat on them too, and yeah. Um, There's got to be multiple factors. I mean, for those, we have them same guys up here, the uh, Omega Protein. They're big, you know, big bunker boats, big per seine and deal. Um, I, I don't think there's nearly the amount of bike bycatch up here as there is down in Louisiana. But you know, they're also hammering on an industrial scale. Right. You know, all the uh, uh, a link of the food chain. You know, I mean, I don't know if we have enough apex predators right now to to eat all the bunker if we were to you know they were completely stop and like there's been all kinds of regs and you know stuff you know that's been happening with those guys up here um changes which you know you know if we have more bait we could potentially have you know support more big fish yeah um you know but and if those guys i don't even feel like those guys are commercial fishing you know those guys Ed is an industrial you know vacuum uh yeah. you know you know, a commercial fishing fisherman in Chesapeake Bay, they got they got wooden skiffs and they're pound netting on the beach, or they're you know have a little tiny piece of gill net catching bunker. And you know, I went commercial bunker fishing the other day with a buddy, and we were just shaking a a little bunker net. You know, I mean, it was it's not like you're not catching hundreds of thousands of pounds a day per boat. You know, right? You're catching right. six baskets. Yeah, you know, it's different. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Yeah, it's uh, the way you see those boats working down there, and they are good, and they got spotter planes and all kinds of crazy stuff that they yeah. they can they can wipe them out but um, we see them every day up here buddy every day we see them with planes and they got six or eight boats really thank yep every Dang. day i see i see them, I see them uh, yesterday really yep. yeah i didn't even i didn't even realize that um i've i've got your your videos lagging a little bit i'm just saying that it's completely fine i'm just saying that for people that are watching he doesn't your voice doesn't come out <laughs> in real life that way so <laughs> If uh, there's people watching me, I, I, I'm, a, I'm scaring the women and children. I should have put on a like a mask or something or COVID mask. <laughs> oh, there you go. Oh, now it just jumped back. Yeah. There you go. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> Are you guys social distancing? Are you six feet apart? Yeah, this is. it's a really uh, big table. What? <laughs> <laughs> It's uh yeah we're not social distancing but it's it's yeah, all right no, it's all right no, we got no. our pants on like we were saying earlier yeah. so we're good. <laughs> I think it's I it's yeah. Well sweet well it, it, I want to I've I've got your name for people that are watching it's Captain Tyler Nunn and then Tidewater Charters is your Instagram and how they can look you up online but um yeah. is is that your website as well tidewatercharters.com? Uh twcharters.com. Okay. Uh it, yeah I think Tidewater Charters was some guy like in Tampa or something crazy. Oh, whatever. really? <laughs> the domain name or whatever. Uh, but yeah, it's twcharters.com. And uh, there's some there's some sweet pictures and stuff and some articles I've, I've uh, written for CCA over the years and some other stuff that's linked on there. So it's mm. not just a, uh, just the normal standard uh, big fish pictures. I want to, you know, hero guide shots. There's, there's some cool <laughs> stuff on there too. Nice. <clears throat> I have one um, more question for you, but... We kind of touched on it a little bit, and since you're tagging this fish, I'm sure you know uh, a lot more than most people, but where do you see the future of cobia fishing going for your area? Um, I think they're probably going to get, you know, with so many people doing it these days, I think that uh, it's going to have to be probably, you know, the reduced, you know, um, creel limit, you know, maybe go to one fish a boat or something like that. I mean, everybody loves catching fish. And I, you know, I think, um, you know, even just seeing the year class and the average size fish shrinking over the years and not seeing like these, you know, big ones that, you know, we used to see super frequently, you know, that's kind of alarming. You know, it's still, it's not like our fishery is definitely not on its deathbed. You know, we're, we're still catching fish every day. They're just a little bit smaller, but, you know, I think like we said earlier, I mean, conservation is a really tough thing. You know, but everybody wants wants fish. The rec guys want fish. Every user group, you know, the commercial guys, everybody wants to have fish. Yeah. And um, I think, you know, if uh, if it, you know, just one fish a boat, if that's what it's got to be, so that everybody can have some and enjoy the fishery, then you know, that would be sweet. You know, and and um, I don't know, but there's just a lot of people these days. You know, and I think everybody should. Especially wreck guys. There's 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 hundreds of thousands of us in in a lot of fisheries, and uh, you know I think everybody should just 
think about that. You know, everybody likes pointing a finger at everybody else, but what if it's us this time? You know, it's uh, it's an interesting thought to think about. You know, it really is. It really is for sure. And you got to think too. And I wonder if there's been any studies done on it. But even with just the rise of the, of the economy, and you know, everyone's making more money. There's more people buying tower boats. There's you know, there, oh my it's got to do way more damage to a fishery and and everyone i mean everyone has the right to get out there and experience it yeah, yeah. yeah for sure it's everybody's natural resource but there's like thousands of more more boats every year really yeah. is yeah. um and uh you know and we're and it, like we were talking about earlier too in the bay too with with missing you know the you know striped bass fishery as as a whole i mean uh, you're just it's not that it's totally gone but there's just a lot less yeah. encounters you know a wreck guy can go out 10 trips and you know, he might only get them one time, you know, and that's really disappointing, you know, and um, I don't know. It just, uh, it's wild. The it whole is. Thing what, is wild. what have they done with the striped bats to it's a, bring that population eight, back? Yeah, there was 18% federal reduction um, okay, last easy. year for striped bass management for everybody. And so certain states did it with like it moving, a, they were doing a slot limit or reducing the creel size or, you know, there was different way or shortening the season. They did all kinds of stuff to try to meet this 18% reduction. Some states did some really dumb stuff, I would probably say, and uh, some states probably <laughs> did better management. But, I mean, it's, um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, they have taken, they have taken steps toward improving the striped bass fishery. And if, I mean, if, and some people probably think it's fine. I mean, if it's a wreck guy that went out three times in a spring and he happened to catch him all three days, he probably thinks it's fantastic. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, if you're out there, like, you just, you know, if you're out there watching things go down every single day, um, you know, then you can, you can definitely develop a pattern, you know, uh, you know, a lot of it's very anecdotal, you know, this is observation based stuff. Most of the stuff I say, so I mean, somebody's probably like this guy's, you know, full of it or whatever, but I mean, this is just what I'm seeing. And, uh, you know, the things that I've, I've learned, you know, I've, I've spent my entire life fishing. <laughs> yeah. And it's so yeah. hard to study it. Like we were saying earlier, you know, observation from a fish that you can you know i mean we're, we're we've got the best guys that are on the water every day are really going to be the best tool to study oh, yeah. what's actually going on mm -hmm. yeah. um you know it's it's not hard science but it is a, it's definitely something that needs to be paid attention to so yeah for sure yeah. and the, well, the, the last thing too with that with the striped bass thing uh you know the hudson fish that biomass of fish seems to be doing quite a bit better than the chesapeake fish so those guys up north too probably thought it was very unfair that they were getting an 18 or whatever it was percent reduction yeah. because their fishery, you know, is better off. But our Chesapeake fish go right through their, you know, their territory too. So I mean, it's and you know, how can you tell? Look at a fish if it's a Chesapeake fish or a Hudson fish or whatever. I mean, it'd be an, it, you know, it's impossible. Right. But I mean, right. I'm sure they're probably a little butthurt up there. But I mean, you know, just everybody, everybody likes to catch fish. So I think it was probably, it, you know, it wants to see fish in the future rather. So it's probably a good thing what what happened. I definitely totally agree with definitely. And you look at North Carolina as a story of the striper fish that we used to have off off the beach and in the Outer Banks, and and it should terrify pretty people. much non-existent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's you know, everybody went to Oregon Inlet in the '80s and, and rock fished. I yeah. mean, there was, I mean, all them guys were doing it and catching big giant slobs, you know. And then when that, you know, that slowed down, then everybody went to Virginia Beach in the winter time, and just the 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 ball of them just got smaller and smaller and smaller. You know, now everybody's like, oh, they're outside the EEZ with you know, like economic exemption zone or whatever, the three mile line. And I'm like, them fish were probably programmed to run out there, and they've been doing it since uh, the since before the pilgrims got here, since the dinosaurs. <laughs> you know, yeah. but it's it's all interesting, man. I, for I, sure. it's, uh, you could sit and talk about fish forever. It's yeah, especially fish politics. You can you can get yeah, people wound up and go forever. So well, cool. Well, we're gonna wrap her up. Is there anything else you want to share or or anything like that before we 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 get we're done with this? No, uh, no, man. I thank you for having me. And, yeah, for uh, sure. I, yeah, I get I, I get ranting and talking, and uh, but yeah, hopefully I said something that that is uh, somewhat interesting. Was I mean, uh, we'll see. You had me on the edge of my seat, man. That's what you want. Somebody can wind up a little bit and just let them run with it. <laughs> yeah, English is even a tough language for me. I usually I start. Yeah, everybody says I talk like a hillbilly or something, to them, but it, it, it's what it is. No, I like it, man. I think people are gonna dig this one, and uh, we have a lot of questions and. And people that want want to hear guys from from your area, and people have specifically asked to hear from you too. So, if you ask me to hear from Tyler, you're welcome. 
I got them. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, thanks, man. Well, I'm going to switch. Well, I'm already on my camera because yours was lagging just a bit. But, guys, thanks for checking out this episode of Eastern Current. Um, we're going to keep them coming. Sounds I've good. I've got a baby coming any day now, so uh, you might see a slight dip in, in podcast, but they'll still be coming. So, we'll, uh, we'll see you on the next one. Later. Have a good one. See you guys.